Welcome to the Failing Writers Podcast. Think of us as the life raft that you're just about grabbing hold of in the rough seas of writing. As the people on a luxury cruise liner wave at you and laugh. Here we are again, Tom. Yes, we are. We're back. We are. Uh, what episode are we on, by the way? It feels like we've done loads, but we haven't done that many, have we? Three. Is it episode three? I think so. Okay. I think so. Season three, episode three. Uh, we've got an interesting little episode today. We've got an interview with a writer. But before we get on to the interview with the writer, I thought it would be interesting to talk about one of our past guests mm. who has created a little bit of a Twitter storm. Yeah. If if you haven't noticed, Andy Stanton uh, is bringing out a book called Benny the Blue Whale. And What's it about, John? <laughs> it's about a blue... Well, it's about a blue whale called Benny. Mm-hmm. Seems normal who, so far. Yeah. He does. Who has a tiny penis. Oh. And it's been partly created using ChatGPT the AI writing bot. And it seems to have not gone down, or the news seems to have not gone down very well. And people seem to have been taking it quite personally. Yeah. Uh, shall I, do you want me to read out some responses? Yeah, the Luddites came out in Ooh, force, didn't they? Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the his, this is what the headline said. It said, One World Signs Andy Stanton Adult Debut. Mr. Gum Creator uses ChatGPT to help write Benny the Blue Whale, and things got interesting when he prompted it to tell me a story about a blue whale with a tiny penis. And basically, <laughs> the rest of the article was behind a paywall, so I'm guessing no one else read any anything else other yeah. than that that bit. I don't think, in this day and age, though, you don't need to know the content of something to draw a strong opinion. <laughs> oh, God, no. The headline, the headline is enough. <laughs> yeah, easily. Absolutely. So, so with that, uh, some of the responses were... I will never buy a book written with AI, and I will boycott any author that uses it. That was one of the early ones. and then Balanced and fair. Yeah. Uh, The next one, disgusting. Interesting. Sorry, just to stop on that one. The the very question is AI gets better. There's an interesting angle of how would you know? And there's there's an element of these people that critique it, that, that think it's a bad thing, that would say, well, we would know. But it's one of those difficult ones, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean... I'm not. It's like saying you'll never watch a film with special effects in. Yeah, but how? Do I'm you... not saying that I don't like the idea of you know the robots writing books for us. Because is that what you, you want, know, John? Think... Is that what you want? No, it's like every. I feel exactly the same as everybody else. I don't. I want it to go away. It's not gonna though, is it? No, it's not gonna. Let's let's be totally honest. I'll read some more of these. Disgusting. The beginning of the end for me feels like the last seven years of countless hours and hard work have been, at best, grossly devalued, if not a complete waste. Mm. That's someone taking it very personally, like it's an actual personal attack on them, which is quite interesting. And I think a lot of people felt, to be fair, I think a lot of people felt that way. Yeah, because it's when they've obviously been putting in the hours and pouring the soul into writing something and feel... I think a lot of these people as well were completely unaware of Andy Stanton's back catalogue and place within the writing community. Well, this is what I was going to get to. A lot of them seemed to think he was just some random newbie that had never written anything before and had just had just thought, oh, right, I can write a book Yeah, because it does say it's his first adult book. Which, to be fair, there seems to be some of that knocking around of of kind of get-rich-quick schemes on on writing now because Mm. you could just put it into the uh, chat GPT and, and... and get it back out. Is there any evidence to show that people are writing full novels with Chat GPT? Not that, I, not that, no. I suspect there might be. Yeah, no, but I think that's the that's the moral panic around it, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to read some more. Yeah. Absolute trash, a scam. Uh, then things got a little bit more nasty. He looks exactly like someone who collaborates like this. He has a very punchable face. Eat a turd. Get fucked. It's that he started turning a little bit nastier. It's relatively harsh, that isn't it? When you think about it. <laughs> Just a little bit. When you analyse what they've, when you read between the lines, there's some microaggressions yeah, in there. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah the uh, the subtext there, I think, is, yeah, is a little bit strong. I mean, I do, I'm sorry, but it is funny. He looks like the kind of person that would. It's just kind of such a thing that there's a, there's a yeah a look of a person that would willingly sort of work with robots. <laughs> He's one of those robot people. Type these people. will be the people that bring That's our it. downfall, John. Exactly. Those types. So my first thought was, and I, I'm kind of aware that this will 
probably make me unpopular with More some unpopular, writers yeah. for saying this, but I'm happy to go on record as saying that I am a massive Andy Stanton fan, as as I'm sure everybody is completely aware. Um, and I actually can't wait to read it. Whoa, right, is that that's not necessarily an objection to AI or promotion of AI. That's your trust of Andy to do it properly, isn't it? it? Exactly is that. Because before everyone turns off the podcast in horror, if you actually read Andy's books or, you, you know, you take the time to find out about him, you'll know that he is a writer that likes to play around. You know, he likes to he likes to subvert people's expectations and he yeah. likes to mess around with form. He's a cheeky monkey, isn't he? He's a cheeky monkey. Yeah. He's mischievous. Mm-hmm. That's a good yeah, word he for is, him. Yeah, linguistically mischievous. Yeah, but he's he's also incredibly dedicated to and fascinated by the craft of writing. So I I, I feel like I can, I can sort of see what his fascination with AI writing is because you know if you if if you're interested in it, then you're going to be absolutely fascinated in a similar way to to me being interested in it. And we, you know, we did that episode on AI writing because it is. Well, we did it ages ago, John, because we're like proper cutting well, edge. Do you know what I mean? Way ahead of the curve. Early adopters, uh, whereas the laggards are just getting into yeah. it now. But when I read the article, you read the article, yeah, because there are versions of it available for free on the internet. I don't see how you can form an opinion after you've read the article. <laughs> Reading the actual article. Hmm. But I was thinking, he's going to be having fun with the idea of AI writing. He's going to be playing with it. He's, you know, the, and the fact that it doesn't write like a human. He's, he's going to be making a point about the creative process. He's going to be making it funny. It's possible that Andy might be our saviour against the singularity and our robot well, overlord. That he is the one exactly. man that can tie it back in knots as it turns out this stuff and, and just it'll start questioning its own existence and just go, on, well, I'm not doing it. Yeah. If you're just going to take the piss out of me, I'm not doing it. <laughs> That's what it'll do to the robots. <laughs> Chat BLT. Just stop them in like, their yeah, tracks. Yeah. Like, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. I like it. He's being mean. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I think that's the thing, isn't it? We, you kind of, from what we know about Andy, he's going to be using it as a as a tool and as as a catalyst. A catalyst is the word I'm searching. Exactly, for. Yeah. He's, he's having a di- he's having a dialogue rather rather than, rather than cheating. Yeah. It's not short. No, he's not doing it because he can't be asked writing he's a not book. Cheating. And I think that's what came across on the the Twitter storm. Made it was all basically formed around the idea that it was a short. Exactly, book. he was yeah. cheating. He wasn't putting in the legwork. He wasn't thinking about anything. Exactly. The computer was doing it all for him, which is a, probably quite a, a normal reaction, a historical reaction to everything, isn't it? To any time a new technology comes in that somehow it's some exactly. massive shortcut and takes away that bit of human input. And from, from the, yeah. the days back in being people putting yeah, yeah. machines in factories that can make cotton quicker and the original Luddites. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of a, it's been, been there forever. Probably the printing press was a similar thing. How You should be writing it by hand. How can You're you putting it? so many monks out of jobs. Yeah, think about Will somebody yeah. think about the monks and their <laughs> illuminations? But I ju- what pisses me off is the, just this massive moral outrage pile on because Twitter, basically. Yeah. But do you think some of that was driven by um, the insecurities of the people on there, the often, often the unpublishedness of people yeah, that feel I think they've it's been a banging their head against a brick wall? Yeah, it's a little bit that because I think people feel like they've almost like they... This is a this is a publishing slot. Yeah, that's gone. It's gone now. That that and chance that, is gone. That should have been a a real writer yeah. taking that slot. But I also think it's mostly because the article was behind a paywall, <laughs> and no one was actually bothering to find out more. And about it's got it. a very hittable and... face, hasn't he, Andy? Do you know what I mean? That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, and that that was the that was. I mean, the I was glad when we I was glad when we interviewed him that it was over Zoom, so we couldn't actually. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. I, I would have been over that out table at him. before we'd even like done the introductions. Oh, God, easily, yeah, just to yeah. give him a smack. But, um... but listen, I found something on Andy's agent's website. All right. And I was really pleased to read it because I thought, this actually, this is kind of exactly what I was thinking is going on. Most people regard AI chatbots as streamlining tools, as all-powerful research engines, or even as an imminent threat to their livelihoods. But Andy Stanton sees things a little differently. Diving gleefully into the conversation, Andy invites ChatGPT to co-write a novel with him. From a simple initial prompt, man and machine find themselves dancing a bizarre cross-species tango as together they build an increasingly hallucinogenic yarn around a benevolent blue whale and his underwater world. Sometimes the AI wants to play along, sometimes it doesn't. It all adds to the mix. This Leviathan improvisation raises all sorts of fascinating questions about language, creativity, and how we understand stories. 
Andy interrogates these themes in his extensive and discursive annotations to the text to deliver an exploded diagram of a novel that examines the DNA of narrative itself. So he's not he's not subvert he's not subverting the thought. He's bloody taking it to bits and then done whatever. It's that's ridiculous. Not as advertised in the headline, is it? But that's going to be incredible by the sound of it. It does. It does sound really <laughs> good. Fair enough to say, it does sound brilliant. It does. So hopefully, when people actually find out about what this is about, they will just calm down a little bit or move on to the next thing yeah. to be morally outraged about. Oh, they'll find something else to be very angry about. I hope um, so. I hope so. Yeah. It, we reached out to him. Um, we sent him a message, and he, he was very told nice. us to fuck right. Yeah. Off, didn't he? <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. Why would he? Why would someone with such hateable face say that? It just puts them <laughs> further in the line of fire, doesn't it? No, he was. Um, he was. He was pleased that uh, that there were people who kind of understood that that probably wasn't what he was trying to do. I.e., just he couldn't be asked writing a novel. The, yeah, the irony is, I would imagine someone as creative and sort of surfing on the edge of language and structure as Andy is would be one of the first people to call you a tit if you said oh yeah i've just got chat gpt to write me a book exactly yeah that is so true if you if you're not doing anything interesting with it you're literally just using it because you can't think of anything because your ideas are a bit poor then i think he would be quite annoyed yeah it'd just be disparaging i would imagine because yeah it seems to at the minute it seems to establish that the chat gpt stuff isn't capable of coming up with a particularly fresh look on anything or it's, it's regurgitating mm. it? it just it just scrapes and regurgitates mm. so it's never gonna do anything brilliant at the minute i'm sure in the future eventually it will make us all Quite redundant possibly. and put us into some kind of uh, mad max situation certainly creatively if nothing else mm. i'm thinking about retraining and becoming like a something phys- anything physical well even that mate it's not gonna become like it's not gonna be able to be a bin man is it or a gardener is it the robots the robots will do all that. I'm thinking maybe mime artist then is the only... <laughs> I don't think they'll be able to do that. There won't be any jobs apart from mime artists. Mime artist market will be going and mental. And those, those statue people yeah, yeah. in town centres. Which is ironic because a lot of them do like robot stuff, <laughs> don't they? They behave like robots <laughs> will, as part it'll of be ro- It'll be robots stood around applauding humans pretending to be robots, won't it? Isn't that thinking about and to think Andy Stanton started all this. <laughs> it's all his fault. He's going to go down in history, isn't he? Yeah. On a list. Of those kind of people. <laughs> Terrible man. Terrible man. Anyway, hey, should we should we tiptoe away from the controversy? From now? our illuminating intellectual chat mm. and move mm. on to more normally what we do yeah. in the show. Yeah. I was thinking it's more like do you remember in cartoons where there's a fight and there's like a cloud of dust and just swinging fists coming mm. out of it. And then one of the characters just sort of steps out of the fray and sneaks away. Dust their lapels down. And, and uh, Does, yeah. sneaks off, and the fight's still going on without them. That's what we're doing now. We just move on, sneak away. Yeah, because we, yeah, we have a we have a nice little interview coming up now with a a writer with a superhuman word oh count. God, so annoying. I know. It's just ridiculous. If we hadn't, if you didn't know better, you'd say be he's cheating and using Chat GPT to write <laughs> stuff. But uh, no, he just uh, he's just insatiable, isn't he? He is. He's he's written quite a few books. But anyway, we'll find out all about it in a minute. Uh, I read his debut book. It is called Good Intentions. His name is Kasim Ali, and it's a really interesting little book. It's kind of a love story, kind of a family drama. And it's sort of about race and about prejudices. And I thought it'd be nice to chat to him. And so here he is. Anyway, today uh, we're thrilled to be joined by a debut author who wrote his first book, annoyingly, over the space of only a few weeks. Um, I think during the lockdowns, but we'll discover more about that in a minute. That book was called Good Intentions, and it's now on bookshelves, and the paperback is out imminently. It's Kasim Ali. How are you doing? I am doing great. Um, Thank you for saying that thing about the few weeks. I love that I said that in every interview that I ever had, (laughs) and now people bring it up all the time. Is it true? You make it sound like you made it up. (laughs) It is, it is true. Have you been it writing this true. for years? You were writing for years, weren't you? Yes. Ooh, this is like um, his 10-year opus. Yeah, overnight success, 10 years. Been yeah. working on it for, you know, two decades. No, I, I wrote this <laughs> in six weeks um, from start oh, to finish. Six weeks, is, that's ages. 
That's so long, right? Six oh weeks God. for a book. <laughs> <laughs> that is really yeah. annoying. Actually. I called you a debut author there, Cassian, but uh, it's actually, this is only the first book you've had released, isn't it? It's not the first book you've ever written. No, I sadly have written, or, or maybe not sadly, I don't know what the right word is, but I've written 21 books before this one. What? And so, y- yeah, you can laugh quite me. A, I'm <laughs> guessing you're a fast reader. When, well, you're a fast writer. When, when, did you, when did you actually start writing books? How old were you? So I, God, I was writing when I was a kid. Um, I actually have this really funny, sad story of going home when I was like 22 or 23 and my mom is like the complete opposite of a hoarder. She's a thrower away. And she every so often is just like, oh, you don't need these things, right? And um, she's telling me after the fact that she's thrown them away. And I went home and I was really surprised because she offered me this like little tiny homemade book that I'd written, a super short story that I'd written when I was apparently like four or five years old. And it was of a kid who like went outside into the street and found sneakers, you know, the whole Americanization of the British youth, <laughs> um, found sneakers on the road and put them on and he could run really fast and he ran so fast that he turned back time and ended up in the time of the dinosaurs and then got eaten by one. <laughs> so tragic. That's got Hollywood movie written all over it. <laughs> well, I think Adam Driver is just about to be in a film like that, isn't he? <laughs> Is he? Wow. Yeah, it's called 65. It's just, been, it's just been optioned. I mean, they've stolen your story. I know. How has it got out? Right, Adam Driver, I'm coming for you, my people and me. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I've been writing since I was a kid, and it was just a, it was just a lot of fun, right? Because, I mean, I am mm-hmm. the super cliche, super quiet kid, loved reading, um, mm. and my, my dad used to tell all these, like, stories, and he was a, he was a really... He, what, he still is. He's, he's alive. Don't know why I just... <laughs> <laughs> you just put him in the past tense yep. there. Sorry, Dad. Uh, sorry to you. Um, he <laughs> is a really good storyteller. So he is able to captivate an entire room of people mm. by telling the most boring story. Like he, he was born in <laughs> Pakistan and he's like telling you a story about the time that he chased a goat down the road. And yet somehow he's managed to make it in the most captivating thing you've ever like oh, heard. That's, that's quite a skill. Yeah, he's, he's very good at it. I think actually in another life, he's like a stand-up comedian who didn't get slapped by Will Smith. And <laughs> so, <laughs> so he he's telling all these stories and I and as a kid, I was like, I want to do that. And so I became like the joker at school who like told all of these stories and got everybody laughing. Mm. And I just like transitioned to the pen really quickly. This is a very long way of saying I used to do like a lot of stuff with making things up for a long time, but it wasn't until I was 17 that I actually started writing like full actual books. Um, So my first one I wrote when I was, yeah, 17 in my second year of college. And it was like circa 80,000 words or something like that. And it was a story about a group of friends who all die at the end because they're so sad. Um, (laughs) I mean, yeah, you've got to go through that, haven't you? We've all been there, you know, the sad teenager who's like, woe is me. And there's actually nothing wrong with your life. So yeah, I, I but I didn't really start submitting until I was like post university. I think that was when I sort of realized I'm reading books that are published and people get paid to do this. So why not me? Mm. And with all those books, with those three million books that you wrote in four weeks, or whatever, <laughs> um, was there like um, a thread running through them, a, a, a genre, a style? Like what was the? Um, so I'm 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 a Pakistani Muslim. So I just literally was like, what if the Hunger Games but Muslim? Um, which is a really interesting thought experiment, actually. Um, so I would just take whatever I was enjoying at the time and put Muslims into it. So I like, okay. yeah, I wrote the I mean, Martian. You could run with that for years. That's, <laughs> That's endless, brilliant. isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Andy Weir would be so happy about it. Um, <laughs> just love the fact that you just keep pitching stuff. I've written a sitcom. It's friends, <laughs> but and just everything. Is just... But Chandler is a Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just... um, but that's basically what I did. And it was really fun. And I remember, yeah, I rewrote The Hunger Games. I rewrote The Maze Runner, Game of Thrones, like wow. all kinds of stuff. And this, these are books that you're, you're just writing them for you or you're planning to send them to an agent or what's happening at this stage? This is early on. Yeah, no, at the time I was writing them just, just for me. <laughs> No, I get that. That's that's why I write. Yeah, I mean, 
it's really interesting because I also work in publishing. Yeah. So I meet a lot of writers and they're always talking about road to publication, journey to publication. Mm. Yeah. For me, it was never, at the beginning, it was never about that. It just was so much fun to just write a story and see where it goes. And That's quite liberating though, isn't it, in terms of the writing process because you're not trying to please anyone. You're not trying to fit into, mm. oh, this is the current thing that's selling. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much freedom with coming from just writing for yourself. And the way that I write is that I don't plan anything. And I mm. guess maybe it was because at the beginning, the books were already written. I was just putting Muslims in them, right? So yeah, someone, someone else had done all the planning for you. <laughs> and the editing and the idea, yeah. Was that the case with Good Intentions as well then? That's, that was a, an unplanned, unplotted book. Yes, so... <laughs> Kazim tells us who he copied it off. No, that's just... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's Pride and Prejudice. Just with uh, Muslims. Just, yeah, with yeah. Muslims. <laughs> no, I, yeah, no, I didn't plan it. I didn't plan it. And it's really wow. funny because it's written in a non-linear structure because yeah. I thought that was the best way to write the story at the time. And my agent was like, we may have to move some stuff around. And I was like, oh, go ahead. I don't, I don't really... Yeah, yeah, whatever. And she was like, oh, but... I'd like to see your plan and your structure and, and how you thought about it. And I was like, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't exist, actually, that document you're looking for. And my editor was the same way. And when I told her I hadn't planned it, she just didn't believe me for a little while and was like, no, 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 it's okay if you did. Like, we can talk about it. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm really sorry. Uh, we can change whatever we want. Like, I don't, yeah. There is no plan. <laughs> There's no plan. Um, wow. That's quite um, impressive if it is non-linear and there's bits kind of... All over the and show. to write it in six weeks as well or whatever and not to have a plan that is quite a, a feat i think yeah. the way that i like to talk about my writing is that it's it's just vibes you know i begin with an idea you know yeah. for for good intentions it came because i watched a film called the big sick and i got really angry um and i literally was like i'm gonna do this but my own version of it <laughs> and what what angered you so have you guys have you guys seen the big sick i know of it but i've never seen it um, so The Big Sick is a uh, Kumail Nanjiani is a Pakistani American comic slash actor now I guess mm. basically just he wrote his own life story which is that he met his wife who is a white woman which is important to the story um, and they started dating and they got really you know they fell in love basically and then she got mm. really sick and she went into a coma and he decided he was going to write this into a film and they made it into a film Judd Apatow I think produced it or directed it maybe and uh, the thing that really frustrated me was that I was quite excited about it because he is a Pakistani Muslim. At the time, mm. I think he was Muslim. I don't believe he is anymore. I'm not really sure. But um, here is somebody writing about his own experience and it's him. He's like acting in it and he wrote it like this is going to be incredible. I was really excited for it. And then I sat down and watched it. And actually, it's a real shame because I think what he does is um, his wife, the woman in the film, she gets a lot of nuance and a lot of space to be a completely whole person. But his mom and the other brown women in his life. So there's like a sort of running joke that his mom is setting him up with a lot of arranged marriages. And he's meeting these women mm. and they're all kind of like one dimensional. So they're all just like talking about, I want to be a wife and I want to have kids. Right. And his mom is just like, when are you going to get married? Whereas his love interest gets to be funny and smart and sexy yeah. and aspirational and all these things and I just got really I got really frustrated with it and I thought I kind of want to see well I kind of want to see an interracial romance that doesn't feature a white person firstly but also mm. I kind of want to see something that that lets non-white women kind of be whole people yeah um these are so these aren't people that you recognize really is what you're saying yeah, I mean, like, like don't get me wrong, my mom loves to talk about marriage. <laughs> but she also loves to talk about, you know, other things. Um, yeah, my mind yeah. is going real blank right now, but I promise <laughs> you, she loves talking about other stuff. Um, but, you know, like, the women in my life, my friends and people in my family, like, they have jobs and careers and aspirations and they're funny, but they're also, like, cruel sometimes. And mm. they are sad as much as they are happy. And mm. yeah, they have so much going on because, uh, guess what? Women are people too. And and non-white women are also people and, and they have all of these things. And so I just found myself really frustrated with that. And I, yeah. and I yeah. wanted to write something that sort of spoke to it. Yeah. I got the feeling reading Good Intentions that you were you were quite enjoying kind of tearing up some some of the sort of common stereotypes about British Muslims like um Noor's best friend is gay and Noor Noor is a good kid but he you know he still smokes a bit of weed and has a secret relationship 
And it's almost like he's kind of, it's like he, he wants to redefine the terms of his parents' culture in a way and their religion to a certain extent. Like he's questioning some of the attitudes, especially within an older age group. Was it, did that fit? Was that like a deliberate decision that you wanted to? Yeah, I um, do that. Or was was? Are you just writing about the people that you know? Do you know what I mean? Is that slightly different thing? Yeah, I kind of. It's really interesting because I think the question is sort of kind of touches on this larger conversation of representation, which I think I have really mm. conflicted feelings on. So, so to answer your question first, I think when I was writing it, I sort of was just like you know, he can't be the kind of boy who follows everything his parents set out for him because then he wouldn't mm. really enter into this relationship. There's no story there, right? Mm. So he yeah. kind of has to be the person who breaks a few rules and does a few things that his parents wouldn't want him to. Yeah. But at the same time, I didn't want this to be yet another story of a Muslim person in whatever kind of culture basically saying, my culture is backwards, my family is backwards, I'm going to run away from it. Yeah, I reject this. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we've seen so much of that. And while those stories are true and, and there are loads of people in the world who feel like that, there are also lots of people in the world who don't feel like that mm. and see their families as a source of love, even as their families are a source of tension. Mm. And so, yeah, I kind of wanted him to be the person who's, you know, trying to navigate these cultural specifics. He's, he's, just, trying to, he's just trying to figure himself out. He's trying to figure out where the boundaries of him are. And the, the shape of his life in comparison to his family's, you know, where does he lie? Mm. And, you know, I've had criticisms um, from Muslim readers. There was a Goodreads mm. review. You know, some advice to the writers reading this, don't read your Goodreads review. I can do it because I'm an editor. So I've, I've got some, <laughs> I've got some, you know, resilience there. But um, it said something along the lines of like, did not finish this, stopped reading this at page 12. Or well, at least they gave it a good go then. Yes, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> 300 and something pages. Can't, I mean, that's, really got deep, that's yeah. pretty fair of them, isn't it? I mean, they're giving it's it more than 10. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they'd ask Goodreads to remove the Islam tag from the book. And that was really interesting to me. So I went back to the book and I was like, what happens at mm. page 12? And at page 12, uh, Noor's best friend Imran is introduced, who is a gay Muslim character. And I sort of realised, mm. oh, right, okay, ah, uh, this... <laughs> That's where I lost you. Oh, okay. yeah. And then I felt really conflicted about it because on one hand, I was like, yes, there are Muslims along with other members of other religions um, believe that homosexuality is a sin, etc., etc. But at the same time, I just was like, oh, you didn't give him a chance. You didn't give me a chance. You didn't give the book a chance. You just made this assumption. Mm. And mm. It, it was quite obsessing, actually, because I just was like, I'd hoped that someone like that would continue reading this book. And then... I had some other criticisms, people saying that it wasn't very, you know, they felt quite disappointed that the Muslims in the book did smoke weed and that they had premarital relationships, um, which is a sin in Islam. And and that, you know, why can't we get a book where the Muslims are just perfect Muslims <laughs> and praying five times a day? And <laughs> Why can't we just have some lovely two-dimensional characters that don't ruffle any right. feathers or cause any drama? And I'm like... That would be... <laughs> it's like that does not make a good story but also and this is like the bigger conversation about representation i feel like we're at this very interesting point in time where there are certain people who are allowed to be messy and by certain people i mean i think we're seeing a lot of stories about women particularly young white women allowed to be messy and have bad sex and in in books and kind of make like Otessa Moshfeg's entire career is based upon like what if this white woman went crazy um yeah but but and that's that's seen as liberating and and moving the discussion forward absolutely it? it's it's like here's the thing I'm fully on board with that I think absolutely we should be able to see yeah. complex dark evil messy women just as much as where we have been seeing men in that space but then when it comes to what I've been seeing the conversation around non-white representation is that people get so angry for two things. Mm. One, if it's not a perfect representation of that specific a group of people, which is such an impossible thing to do. There are like 2 billion Muslims in the world. There is absolutely no way mm. one person can represent yeah, yeah, yeah. even a 1% of those people. And then the other thing that they get angry about is um, if that representation isn't their representation, the way that they live their lives. And this one really mm. bothers me because yeah. actually I was, at, I was at an event with an author talking about this kind of stuff. And I remember saying to him that like, 
I am one of four. So I have three siblings. We are all mm. so, so, so different from one another. And we were born mm. and raised in the same environment with the same parents, went to the same school. And yet we are so completely different. How am I going to, as an author, be able to represent the specific worldview and the life that you, an unknown reader to me, has when I couldn't even do that mm. for my own brother? Because we are so different. Mm. It just feels like a very limiting conversation right now. And I feel like it's a real controversial take to have, but I feel like sometimes it's your own people, quote unquote, who sort of hold you up to higher levels of like perfection and criticize mm. you the most. Because actually, uh, it's the white readers who, while some of them are like, what's a samosa? And I'm like, oh my God, come on. But <laughs> most of them are very nice about the book and, and talk about how, you know, it was really refreshing to read something like this from a non-white male perspective. Mm. So I, I find that really frustrating. And I, I talk about it constantly and I just don't know how we move it forward. I think probably just by doing it again and again, I imagine. I mean, yeah, I suppose the question is, what, what are you going to books for? You know, if you want to read books because you want to purely be entertained or something, then there are books for that. But it feels to me that literature is about trying to discuss things. I mean, it's almost like every book is a thought experiment. The, 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 idea, the idea of going to, to literature or a book to just reaffirm your narrow worldview is, is quite a strange mm. concept, really, isn't it? In the history of the fiction book, it doesn't really fit with uh, why it exists. <laughs> it's kind of like the entire opposite of, of what you feel it should be doing, really. And I, I, I completely understand that, like, you know, when you watch a TV show like uh, that Bodyguard TV show that came out a couple of years ago, I think, which featured terrorism from Muslim people, you kind of think, OK, like, why are we mm. having this story yet again? Why are we going down this route? I completely understand criticising that kind of content because that that is quite limiting. That is quite dehumanising. Mm. But when you have writers such as myself who are trying to, I guess, trying to write about their own experiences, trying to write about how they see the world, mm. trying to reflect themselves, like, I don't, I don't get that criticism. I mean, I can sort of understand it in the sense that you, I think it's very, it's very tempting to want to celebrate your own culture, isn't it? And especially when you're a community that, you know, potentially are already quite marginalised. You maybe want to turn a bit of a blind eye to the things that are more difficult, more complicated. Um, but that's also, that's why I really like this book. You know, it, it feels uh, unflinching. It feels real. You know, your close relationships are the ones that are the hardest to talk about. They're the most confusing. And I think, uh, I think that's why you've got to keep doing it. Yeah, well, I did just finish writing book two. <laughs> oh, good. It only took me... He's just, he's just done that while yeah, talking. Yeah, I just <laughs> literally asked me what we talking. It doesn't take him very long. Yeah. <laughs> When you say book two, is that this isn't a continuation of Good Intentions? This is a completely separate. Yeah, book or... yeah. I'm I'm not a fan of uh, sequels because, listen, I'm not James Cameron. I can't do it. Okay, you know he he keeps doing it. I don't know. I don't know how he does it. Hey, listen. When the money runs out, you'll be doing it. Good Intentions, too good, too intention. What? How would we? Be like right. It's, tit it's Titanic. But with Muslims. <laughs> Somehow, Nude finds himself on a boat in the 19, early 1900s. <laughs> um, no, book two is a standalone, um, which I've been working on for the past. Actually, you're not going to like this, but I just finished writing and it took me two months. Um, but it's twice as long as Good Intentions. So. Oh, come so on. Wow. Hang on. I, I'm just thinking about this, right? You... You started writing books at 17. You, okay, so you've been writing, let's call it 10 years. You've written 22 novels. By that reckoning, I should have written like nearly 70 novels by now. <laughs> um, only if you can... I, I was starting to like ah, you, Cassie. Okay, sorry, let me... And that, that brings our interview to an end. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Goodbye. I have no problem with someone writing stuff that quickly, Cassie. Um, but I do think if you do write that quickly, it should be rubbish. I don't think I don't think you should be able to no really right, no. do it that quickly and also get like lauded for the content you're producing. Just my view. Fair enough, and I, I take that on board. But it did get edited, and the editing took you know months of me and my editor going back and forth and adding bits and yeah, taking away yeah. bits. So I'm always like, yeah, the first draft took me. I'm like a very very quick drafter. So like I yeah, in in complete honesty, like. 
while I was writing book two, which RIP to my editor just came in at 161,000 words. Sorry to her. Um, I, I would literally finish my, my job at like say 5 PM. And if I wasn't going for a run or to the shop, or whatever, I would put my work laptop away and then pull out my personal laptop and be writing for like 90 minutes. Um, straight after work and then I would probably watch a film or have dinner or blah, blah, blah. um and then when I got back from whatever I was doing I would uh spend another half an hour writing before I went to bed so like every day I was doing like two hours um that's not a lot though isn't it two that feels like quite a lot of time for me <laughs> I mean it's great just the fact that you've got a full-time job and you're still writing see Tom and I have been using that excuse for ages uh. and yeah, this this isn't helping. <laughs> Sounds a bit shaky now, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Just starting to feel like maybe there are other things yeah. going on, Tom. Yeah. Um, mm. I can't, I can't deny and, or confirm. I can't do anything about that. Sorry. <laughs> and I, know, I noticed on your on your website, on your little uh, bit about you, it does say that you're working on your third novel currently. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I actually finished or twenty fifth novel, depending on how. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I finished writing that last year and. Yeah, I'm I'm now writing book four and some other stuff. Um, Jesus, can't even keep up. Okay. Yeah, I write I write all the time. <laughs> I write constantly. It's wow. every day for me, and it's not like a chore. I think that's been a really interesting. Sounds more like an addiction. Are uh, you it? trying to make this seem like a bad thing? My God. Um... No, no, it's just it just it seems like you, there is obviously a massive compulsion. Just like, could you even imagine not being? If someone said, right, you're not allowed to write anymore, what would that do to you? Yeah, I have no idea. When I get sick, I get so angry because I can't write. Yeah. And it really, it really, like, I get so angry about it because all I can think about is I've, I've always got, like, projects going on, right? And and here's the thing. It's like not all of them are for publication. Some of them, most of them, nearly all of them, really, are just because I'm like, wouldn't it be really fun to try to write a film? Wouldn't it be really fun to try to write a 60,000 word book in like lesser form wouldn't it be really interesting to write in the first person or whatever I just do it because of that and when I can't write like for for example I've got two very good friends we're trying to plan this like staycation thing where we like hire an Airbnb and then lament Airbnb and what they're doing to the housing economy whilst we're in one um (laughs) yeah fight it from the inside brother yeah absolutely um you know (laughs) Dave, Dave said that I can't take my laptop with me. Um, oh, what? Which is like absolutely brutal. And I've been literally negotiating with them for like two weeks <laughs> saying, please let me take my laptop. And they're like, no, if you finish writing your book when we do this staycation, leave your laptop at home and it'll be better for you. It'll be good for your mental health. And I'm like, it doesn't feel good for my mental health. It, it feels like, you know, like if you had a so an alcoholic or something that was sneaking a hip flask and pouring it into the coffee, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be sat there with a notebook. And you'd be sneaking, That's right. sneaking it out sneaking and just writing. And they go, what are you doing? You're writing a book. It's not a laptop. <laughs> and no, it's just a, 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 a shopping list. I'm writing a shopping list. Um, they did say they were going to monitor my phone usage because <laughs> you can obviously like write on your phone. And I was like, this is feeling, this is feeling bad, guys, actually. I this don't like, like this. like an intervention, isn't it? Like a, mm. <laughs> wow. Yeah, rehab, basically, isn't it? Rehab for the guy who keeps writing too much. <laughs> I'd quite like to maybe talk a bit less about your success, Kasim. How many of those books that you wrote have been submitted and rejected? Okay. And sorry to focus on the negative here, but oh that, my God, that's no, kind listen. of our thing is failing. And we really like to pick away at that scab. So I absolutely love talking about failure because my father has deemed me one since the moment I was born. <laughs> oh. Um <laughs> You the big family disappointment then? Oh my God, absolutely. Are you kidding me? I'm 28 years old. I'm not married. And I live with a woman who is not my wife. I know. Devastating. And guess what? I'm not even dating her. She's just a friend. 
we just <laughs> share a flat together. It's what? very disappointing. Failure is like a really big thing for me. Uh, that sounds like, that makes me sound like the biggest <laughs> loser on the planet. Um, because I not only write books, I also was like, I'm going to try to get into the publishing industry, which is like one of the most competitive places mm. to try to get a job at. So I've been through rejection, my God, basically my entire adult life. So when I finished university and I started sending these books out to people, I only started doing that when I found myself writing original ideas. So instead of yeah. doing the whole what if X with Muslims, I actually started writing things that I was just thinking of myself. That's when I began mm. looking for agents and sending stuff out. I got rejected constantly. I think out of the 21 books that I wrote before Good Intentions, I would say half of them got rejected by agents. Um, and the rejection letters, emails were completely just automated emails, copy and paste jobs, um, mm. because I the, nobody liked what I was putting out there. But the thing is, is, I guess by that point, because I had spent those four years, let's say 17 to 21, mm. just like writing a book, finishing it, starting a next one, mm. it was already ingrained in me yeah. that even though this got rejected, I'm just going to start another one. Actually, by the point that it did get rejected, <laughs> I was already like 10,000 words into the next one. I was going to say, for a lot of writers, they'll be like, oh my God, I've spent like two years writing this and it's been rejected and now it's going to be another two... You'd be like, well, that was a waste of three and a half weeks. I'll write another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It probably helps with the resilience when you feel like you've, you've got so many words coming out of you. I mean, absolutely, right? Because I was writing so much and it was such a joy. I think yeah. this is the thing that I always go back to is it is fundamentally such a joy for me to sit down and write a book. It's never felt like a chore. It's never felt hard. Mm. It's never felt impossible. It's just mm. such a joy for me to do it. I love it so much that when those rejections came in, I didn't think I was a bad writer. I thought this book didn't work. So let's just write another one. What, <laughs> what a fantastic attitude to have that is. That is brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I've, I have I really do put it down to the fact that I was just writing for joy yeah, and, yeah. and I've continued that throughout. And then with my publishing career, that was, that was different because that is quite personal. That is a rejection of you. <laughs> Like you're the product you're trying to sell and then they say no and you're like, okay, there's something wrong with me. So I found that quite hard uh, because I was very lucky at the beginning of my publishing career. I had a six month internship at Faber and Faber, mm. which was paid and I moved to London and I didn't know anybody and I was very poor um, and I used to walk everywhere. And I thought, okay, I'll get a job after this. And I just didn't for quite a while. And then when I did get a job, it was at a super small, badly managed indie in the middle of nowhere. And when I tried to get a job after that, it took me 18 months and about 100 applications. Wow. Um, yeah, it was really, it's really quite tough on that side of stuff. But again, it was this sort of, I think I have this like sheer force of will where I'm just like, either it's going to happen or I will be dead. Not that not, not I'm going to Emperor Nero myself, <laughs> but I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow myself to not make it. Like I'll have to be mm. dead for me to not make it. Um, so I just kept doing it. And you know, I had this friend of mine at the time who, she's a poet and um, she used to send all these poems out and get rejected. And she used to find it really, really difficult. And we'd constantly have these conversations about rejection. And she just never understood how I could go to a job interview, give my all, get invited back for a second one, and then not get the job and immediately just like go apply for another one. She just didn't <laughs> get it. And she actually, it was really interesting. We would have conversations where she would say, this is really unhealthy. You need to sit with your feelings. Um, and I would just keep saying to her that there are no feelings because the only feeling is like determination. Yeah. I mean, if that's the job you want, you just got to keep plugging away, haven't you, I suppose? Yeah. And I, I, I'm really honest about that with people when I, when I talk to prospective publishing hopefuls, mm. that is quite difficult. And it took me like a really long time. And there are some people who've had an easier journey into it, but I had quite a tough one and this is what it looked like, but I just kept going. And, and I genuinely think that even though it was quite difficult at times when it, I started to wonder, am I the problem? <laughs> I I think <laughs> having had all those rejections for my books and being able to keep going there, I think that fueled like my determination on this side. Mm. Um, and I think they were working in tandem and I just kept going. And then it's one of those, I absolutely, I hate that this is the way that it happened because it's such a cliche, but in 2019, I wrote Good Intentions and I sent it to three agents. Um, I really looked them up and I 
you know, because at the beginning I was just sending them out to anybody, but then mm. you sort of hone, you know, as I learned about the publishing industry, I was like, actually, I'm just like, this is really bad of me. I shouldn't be doing this. I should be being specific. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I chose three agents and I sent it to them and they all rejected it within 24 hours. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, great, cool. Let's just, yeah, fine, whatever. And then uh, a couple of things happened. I got long listed for the most Suturan prize that Hachette were doing, mm. which is a, a prize set up by, um, I believe she used to be a rights person who worked at Hachette and she passed away. And her husband set this up as her kind of legacy. So I got long listed for that. I had a short story accepted for publication in the Good Journal, which is really exciting. Mm. And I got a job offer from Penguin and then I sent it out to three more agents and then Julia Pickering, my agent, offered me representation. So those things happened in all such quick succession. Yeah. And it really felt like, it just felt like a movie in that I didn't really truly believe that it was real. <laughs> and so I moved to London to start working at Penguin. I had my agent who's genuinely incredible. And then COVID happened because of course it did. And then we sold the book because of course it was in peak lockdown where I was stuck in my like four by four room that I was paying so much money for that had become basically like a cell that we sold this book and I was unable to celebrate it. <laughs> <laughs> that is harsh. I feel like um, publishing, well, I suppose lots of mainstream media took a very long time to respond to the idea that there's a, an appetite for diverse voices. But it feels like there is a kind of a barrier has broken now and not only are there, are there books for people who haven't necessarily been represented in the past, but actually a lot of those books have even found a mainstream audience as well across lots of walks of life. D you must have seen that kind of happen close up as someone who's been working in publishing for the last few years. Does that feel like that's beginning to happen more and more? Yeah, so... Yeah, I'm quite cynical. I think this is the only place in my life where I'm quite cynical about something. <laughs> Which is an allusion to a conversation we had before the podcast began recording. <laughs> That's in the Patreon link, actually, for subscribers. <laughs> yeah, just um, click, click here <laughs> for that discussion. Um, I'm, really, I'm really quite cynical about this discussion because I think that from the outside, it may look like that. But when you're on the inside, actually, the, the reality is that, you know, I, I said this thing like two years ago and it's kind of still feels very true where I believe I was talking to somebody who said that there's a glass ceiling for women in publishing as there is kind of everywhere. And then I said, mm. but there's a concrete ceiling for non-white people. <laughs> mm. And I believe that's still kind of true. And by that, I mean, there are a lot of diversity initiatives. Let's just talk about non-white people specifically because I think mm. that's where a lot of the, the noise has been. A lot of non-white people get into publishing at the assistant level. Half of them leave because they realize I'm getting paid nothing. Yeah. You know, I just can't afford to live in London. I don't want to live in London. And this environment isn't for me. So like literally, I think half of them leave. The half who stay work really, really hard to get promoted and mm. then only get promoted to a very mid junior level. So editorial assistants will become assistant editors. Out of those assistant editors, so few of them will become actual editors. Out of those editors, two of them might become the step above. And so the higher you go up, the, you see that the people who are actually making these decisions, they're all white people. Mm. And that's the problem for me. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, is like, I will always point to um, Tony Morrison and James Baldwin as like examples that this like idea that publishing, I think is trying really hard to sell at the moment, which is, oh my God, people now want to read black and brown voices. Mm. No, that's just simply untrue. Not only have black and brown people been readers the entire time that literature has existed, they've also been writers. So like <laughs> this idea that it's just in the last like 10 years that suddenly black and brown people have like discovered literature is completely <laughs> yeah, untrue. Clearly, yeah. um, And it really, it, it frustrates me to no end. In, in publishing, you hear these like senior people talking about it like it's a brand new thing. And you're like, are you, are you fucking kidding me? You know, there's, there's, there's like another slice of the pie, right? Which is, and I, let's talk about editing because I think it's really important to have non-white people across the board, but mm. the editors are quite important because they literally buy the books and publish them. Uh, yeah. If you don't have non-white people in editorial positions high enough up where they can make the really big advance yeah. uh, deals, mm. where they can make those decisions as to like the shape of a list, like a publishing list mm. for the next three years, then you're not going to get those books in and they're not going to get published well. 
But what also happens is that sometimes those books do come in and they get bought and published and they get published horrifically. And what I mean by that is the editing is bad. Right. Because, and I think it's twofold. Um, I think editors, some white editors feel scared that we can't edit this book because we would be seen as trying to censor. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. You know? That's like a fascinating, strange mm. thing that's happening. But on the other hand, they just don't know how to publish something that doesn't look like them and doesn't speak to them. And so sometimes books will come in that challenge the sort of ingrained definition that a mm. reader is a white middle class woman living in North London. Mm. And they don't know how to publish a book like that. So then they just try to publish it to that market. Mm. And then sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. There are all these problems. And and no one really seems to be wanting to have the actual conversation. So instead, they just lean on, we have a diversity program. Or mm. we did this like really big uh, book deal for a black woman for six figures. We did that one time last year. So we're like, good. So that, bo- that box has been ticked, thank you. Right. Back to normal. Don't need to, yeah, don't need to buy another one for like two years. And and yeah. the irony, the irony of it is that America is so much better than us in this regard because, mm. and I think it's got to do with how America and Britain approach the specter of racism. Yeah. And I think America is just so much more open about having those conversations that it just feels like the conversation there is like years ahead of where we mm. are here in, in the UK. That does feel like a sort of, uh, attempt at colour blindness in the UK, to, I think, to a certain extent. We don't like to look it straight in the eye. Yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> I could talk about this forever. And, and here's the thing. I'm an editor and my line manager is a Pakistani Muslim woman. I've never had a Pakistani Muslim anything in any team that I've been in. Yeah. So this is like incredible. I like genuinely like yeah. what an incredible position to be in. I'm an editor, so I get to buy books now. How cool. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get a promotion or change jobs and get a more senior position. And hopefully my career continues like that. I can point to a handful of other non-white editors across the industry who are doing the work. I just think as always, there needs to be more work done, but I think publishing gets off really lightly because they do the big thing and they pay six or seven figures for like a one book a year. And then they get... They get to feel like they've done the, the mm. they've done the work and actually they haven't. Um, and what I found personally is, you know, when you try and have these conversations with people, they just turn around and say, "I'm not racist." <laughs> and you're like, I'm not. I didn't call you a racist. I uh, it's talking about structural problems within the way we work. I'm not a racist though. It's much more complicated <laughs> than that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I could name and shame. I won't though. I need to keep my job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's stop talking about. It. Let's move on. <laughs> Do you know what we haven't talked about? What haven't we talked about? Um, I was going to ask you just to tell us a bit more about the story of Good Intentions. Ah, uh, you're going to get uh, me to self We self-pitch. kind of talked about why you wanted to write it, but give us a little bit, give us a flavour of the story. Uh, sure, okay. I've been doing this for a year. It should come really easy to me, hopefully. Yeah, so <laughs> Good Intentions is the story of Noor, who is a young Pakistani Muslim boy i guess because we first meet him when he's like 19 and then at the end he's like 24 mm. and he meets yasmina who's a sudanese muslim woman which is to say she's black and um they are real cutesy and they get into a relationship with each other and oh how fun is this except then like the the sort of core conflict of the book is that Noor doesn't want to introduce yasmina to his parents or in effect take any kind of step forward because he believes that his parents are anti-black because of the the sort of nature of South Asian communities and that sort of anti-blackness that's quite prevalent in them. Yeah, it sort of explores that relationship. Um, I very much did the debut novelist thing where I tried to talk about too many things. So it also deals with like friendships and the expectations of friendships, um, the relationship between parents and their children and what is expected of children, but also what is expected from parents um, deals with homophobia in the Muslim community. Um, all kinds of things, really fun. Um, and anxiety, mental health, there's also <laughs> that in there too, because I thought, you know, why not? And yeah, essentially it's about, I think if I was to like say, it, uh, sorry, a logline or whatever, it is very much about the sort of anxieties of like millennial Muslims in Britain today. That was, that was very good. Oh, thank you. That was very succinct. You can tell you've been doing that a lot. I, we've taken up a lot of your time, Cassim, but I, I, have by, a, hasn't it? I have a question to ask you now. Um, 
Always um, says so his awkward question for the end. Kasim. So yeah, brace, I do. Brace yourself. Let's, so we finished. We, let's say we finished the chat, right? And this is this is just between <clears throat> you, me, and Tom, right? Okay. How did you do it? Come on. How do you, how do you write a book in a few weeks? How can Tom and I achieve a book in six weeks? What's the real secret? Wow. Um... <laughs> <laughs> be more talented and actually do it, um, do it? Those, are those the things <laughs> well here's the thing right? seems like those are the things it's got to be uh, a secret Tom there's got to be something that we Tom, haven't figured shortcut, out yet John. there isn't a shortcut it's just doing it isn't it you've got to do it well I don't know the intricacies of your life you know I will just put my hands up here now and say that I have no children <laughs> I have no okay, pets I'll because of my landlord a little bit yeah. Get rid of the kids and the pets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Don't do that. So if you do those two things, and then I guess if you just... What, so you were saying, get, you're saying get divorced and just get rid of, get rid of the... Well, I didn't say get rid of your partner. Baggage. Get rid of the baggage. You know, your partner might be there to, you know, really emotionally support you. Uh, you're not, well, not not when I've got rid of the kids and the pets, man. <laughs> oh, right, sorry. She's going to be angry. So <laughs> she's going to have to go too. Um, so basically... Do you want any kids or pets? Kasim, just while we're on. Do I want them? Yeah, I got uh, the kids are lovely, so well behaved. <laughs> um, okay, we'll maybe look at other options. Yeah, maybe. Um, get rid of them, and then I guess <laughs> just have this sort of absolute cold, hard determination mm. that you are going to do it because if you don't do it, then your father was right about you <laughs> all those years ago. Okay. I think so, I, I think I get it now. Yeah. Okay. And I can tell you that I bottled it up. Don't worry about I it. I mean, we all need motivation from different places. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's important. I think genuinely to to answer the question quite genuinely, actually, for me, it is it is very much about like the joy. I think it's the joy. Yeah. That hasn't left me yet, and I really hope it doesn't. But it is just such a joy to do this that I am like quite sincerely every day grateful that I get to mm. do it. That I you know have fingers and i have a laptop and i have the time to do this like genuinely i'm not even kidding yeah, yeah. just grateful for those to those things that allow me to do this what about when you when you hit a really gnarly bit you know what i mean like a real tricky plot point and you just oh, i don't know how to get through this next bit you're just still there like la 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 <laughs> just... well so okay do you remember how i said i don't plan so when i when i write oh, yeah, my right. when i write my books um so you'll just write around the plot point <laughs> i guess i guess so I, i'm going. always like surprised by myself if that makes any kind of sense so the the ending of good intentions i didn't know until i wrote it oh wow wow so yeah i never have a plan and that keeps the, the excitement for me and it's really interesting in my second book i actually had to rewrite it which maybe i should have talked about i should have talked about that damn but uh I, yeah i had to rewrite it because my editor was like there are all these things uh that are not working and i was like all right fine perfect is there a, a rough kind of idea when that one might be out? Um, I'm not. I'm not really sure because, yeah. But my editor, she just basically bought a lot of books last year, so she's steadily mm. working her way through them. I gave myself the arbitrary deadline of like two months to write this book, and then I was mm. like three days late, and I was profusely apologetic. And she was like, "I gave you six months. Why are you apologizing?" <laughs> um, <laughs> So she has it now. Yeah, your she... deadlines don't count. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, listen, Miss Editor, I actually work to the beat of my own drum. Thank you. Um, She's probably used used for authors telling her that, but it's probably usually massively the other way yeah, around. Yeah. She so. has she has said that. Um, so she won't get to it for a while. Yeah. So which is why yeah. currently I am working on book four and a film because why the fuck not, right? <laughs> yeah. Why not? Why not? <laughs> well, I got a spare ten minutes. Where's the knockout screenplay? <laughs> Never written one before. Let's see if it's shit. Who knows? Well, if it is, you can come back on and share it with us. I'll tell you all about the failure to write a script. Um, and then I'll produce about 20 of them that I've written. And then you guys can just <laughs> shout yeah. at me again. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I love that. <laughs> well, thanks, Kasim. Yeah, that was great, mate. Lovely to meet you. Thank Bye. you very much. Uh, I'll see you guys soon. I don't really know how to end these. Bye. <laughs> see you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> all right, bye, guys. Well, people were forewarned about his ridiculous 
word count spewing outness. I mean, that's just mental, isn't it? It is. How can you be that age and have written so many books? I know, and he seems to... Sp the, the thing that is most upsetting, he seems to... Enjoy it. <laughs> he seems to, A, enjoy it, and B, not spend that much time writing. Well, now you see, it's interesting you say that. He outlined what he does, that kind of two hours a day. Mm. But this is the thing, he does that every day. That's part of his absolute inbuilt set in stone mm, routine yeah and then not having kids thing that is a big yeah yeah big bonus. i mean yeah. I, I know we're i know we're making excuses we're trying to justify but our there's own... a huge thing about putting that time in every day so it's it's part of your yeah, yeah. life i mean it's easier for him because he enjoys and looks forward to it <laughs> so i mean that's a huge win isn't it, it to is. have that mindset yeah because even i mean some of the successful authors we've talked to do you know it's a, it's a bind and it's a treacle to be walked through Whereas he's he's surfing across the top of it, isn't yeah. he? He's eating a bit yeah, of the treacle well as he goes and enjoying the treacle yeah, and not getting stuck it. in it. That metaphor's gone as far as it <laughs> I think will so. now, so we should probably move on. I feel like he takes uh, a, a laptop or a notebook everywhere he goes, doesn't he? And mm -hmm. as soon as he mm -hmm. gets a moment, he's there, he's right. Well, I said, I said, didn't it? It's an addiction. He's, he's kind of, and it, it just it is. He can't, <laughs> can't go on holiday without it. So, yeah, he's... Uh, yeah. Anyway, good on yeah, him. Good luck to him. Good, good on him. him. That sounded genuine, didn't it? <laughs> Good luck to him. Well done yeah. on that, being able to do that. Yeah, That's lovely great. for you. Great stuff. So, Tommy, what's uh, what's coming up? What's what's on next time? We can't say next week anymore, can we? Because it's not next week. It's the week no, after. it'll be the week after. What's coming up next time? Oh, I'll tell you what we've got next time. Aunt. What have we got next time? We have got the lovely, lovely Ian McMillan. Oh, we have. Poet extraordinaire. Yeah. Broadcaster, poet, raconteur. And just a bloody nice guy he really is and he's got some uh really funny anecdotes and stories it's mainly just um, it's mainly just him doing his raconteur but isn't it is him just, yeah it's lovely just lovely, talking so. about his life in writing and telling his little stories but uh yeah, yeah make sure you join us yeah. for that lovely little episode anyway, anyway that's in a couple of weeks but before we end today mm. uh, as our part of our ongoing contribution to the writing community um much valued by all of the aforementioned writing community, we need to do our um, whip me with your rhythm stick. I don't know what. <laughs> your rhythm whip. We still, I mean, we're still not coming up with a set, set name. Well, we've asked people that are listening to send in the start of their current work in progresses uh, for us to have a little look at. And whatever that is, if it's a, it could be a short, little short story or a book or a screenplay, whatever it is, we'll stick it on the pile of things that we, yeah. we think sound interesting and we, we can talk about. I mean, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but what we realised uh, quite soon when people started sending things in was that we felt massively under-equipped and under-qualified to really offer anything. But um, <laughs> Craig Margolis, who we talked about his work on the, on the last episode, he, he was very grateful. And said mm. we raised some good points, and it was very useful. So I think that might be the peak of our. <laughs> it's all downhill there. now. Yeah, I think it could be it. Um, but very kindly, one of our very most favourite listeners, uh, A. B. Finlayson, um, has sent us in some of his current work. And I noticed on Twitter the other day that he's actually mm. just finished this as well. Oh, has he? So when he oh, when cool. he sent this in, it was like three quarters finished. Yeah, a couple of weeks back, and now yeah, he did, literally the other day, he just kind of uh, written. The end. Good work, mate. So yeah, this is this is a a raw first draft, as he was very keen to point out. And I found this one quite interesting because it's well, it's called "Won't Somebody Please Think of the Orcs," and it's very much set in that kind of fantasy yep. arena. Something I don't really read. I mean, yeah, the nearest I can think to this is that I read some Terry Pratchett when I was about fourteen, and that's probably my only little uh, delve into the world of fantasy, really. Mm. So I feel even more unqualified to offer an opinion on this. But uh, to give people an idea of the style and where it's at, here's a little snippet from the very, very start of Chapter One. Orc are often depicted as big, brutish bastards with all the manners of a university rugby club on a night out in Weatherspoons. Ugly, misshapen, and with skin somewhere on the vast colour spectrum of a hammered thumb, orcs are vilified, reviled, and feared. The fact they usually have teeth rivaled only by years of upper-class British inbreeding really doesn't help. Some stereotypes ring true. When it looks like an orc, smells like an orc, and talks like an orc, it probably isn't a pretty princess. And therein lies the problem. 
stereotypes can be misleading. Let's tell no lies. There are orcs out there who are utter bastards and will eat your nan given half a chance and a bottle of hot sauce. But, and this is crucial, not all of them. This story is about the others. It is about stereotypes, tropes and misunderstandings. It is also about a call to, admittedly accidental, adventure. Where to begin? Ah yes, the status quo. Let's get rocking all over this world. Banished to the grey north of Torva, pushed back behind the vast threshold, into a land of barren plains and sharp mountains, the orcs thrive in the industry of war. It is bleak in the north, colourless and drab, with all the flavour of tinned spam and boiled cabbage. It is no wonder the rest of the world looks up and shudders. The great island continent of Esajova really comes into its own when you head further south, though of course even the great dividing double walls of the threshold can't cut off the grim north entirely. It bleeds beneath the giant stones like a stain, spreading like an oil slick. In fact, it takes a fair few leagues for the colour to really kick in, but when it does, it's all green and verdant fields, lush forests and beautiful rolling hills. The picture postcard world in which the elves have populated the vast Westeron forests and the dwarves have built their halls and cities in the mountains on the other side of the continent because that is what elves and dwarves do. And there are humans, of course, those buggers get everywhere. Towns and cities litter Esajova, from the threshold which marks the northern limits of Upir, all the way to the kingdom of Dan South and the great southern ocean. The world is familiar, comfortable and easy to understand, if a little derivative. But how it came to be is anyone's guess. It could be that some apocalyptic event plunged the land into a fantasy scape somewhat recognisable to those with a keen eye for a hidden clue, or it could be that this world is both somehow in a galaxy far, far away and taking place a long, long time ago. Oh, you know that the whole thing is the creation of a simpleton or a group of gods who got bored. We shall see. The story unsurprisingly begins with an orc sitting on a high rock on a plateau in the north of Esajova, beyond the great twin walls of the threshold itself, inside the orc realm of Torva. You will be forgiven for missing him, as your eye will no doubt be drawn to the vast valley and the huge battle raging far below, because these things always start with a battle. Our orc's name, by the way, is Gary, and he's bloody annoyed. Very nice, yeah. very nice. It does have a whiff of the Pratchett, doesn't it? It does, it does. I think that's why I mentioned it before, really, kind of. Which is a very, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to do, isn't it? Because it's, you kind of think, God, if you're trying to take influence from someone, it's a great person to take influence <laughs> from because it's brilliant, very but best. it's a really high bar to try and get to, to isn't it? It is, it is. It's nice, though. It's, um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great concept. It is, isn't it? To start with. Um, it's, yeah. I find... I mean, you read his uh, reindeer book, didn't you? His uh, reindeer story. I did. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. It's very readable. It's so easy to read. Yeah. He's got he's got a lovely. I don't know what I don't know what it is like a, a rhythm. Uh, it's just it just is uh, really easy to kind of absorb yeah. and read. And it's it's speckled with nice little jokes. It is. It's that you could potentially even miss quite easily. Yes. Um, I thought this was really interesting reading this because in in that bit that we that I've just read out there, mm. there's quite a lot of referential jokes, isn't there? to all kinds of stuff mm. about the, the North and the South and referencing the genre itself yeah. and kind of playing on itself and kind of sort of meta references and everything. And I think obviously that was probably part mm. of his main idea, if you like, that first spark of idea was that it'd be fun to do that as well and to, you know, reference Star Wars or all these different things that you got. Yeah. And as you, as you read through further on from where I read, because that was very, that's right at the very, that is literally the start of, of chapter one as it stands mm. they kind of take a little bit more of a back seat as sort of the characters and the story come to the fore i thought it was quite interesting obviously this is, a, this is a first draft and that might be something that then gets filtered out or whatever but i just thought it was quite interesting to see that that you could kind of see the uh mm. the idea the raw idea at the start if you like and then you could kind of feel it being shaped and molded as as, as you kind of read through the couple of chapters yeah yeah so where yeah where do you think it's going do you get a feeling for that um not really. Obviously, it moves on to to talking about the lives mm. of the two orcs, doesn't it? Gary and 
Right. Yeah. And then in chapter chapter two, you you feel like you're meeting the antagonist, the person who's going to sort of help to flip everything upside down and yeah. make everything difficult. The the kind of the bad guy who has to be vanquished. Yeah. And I think um, I think I said to you, I, think I don't really have that much to say about it, and that's not a a bad criticism. That's mm. kind of a John. There's nothing nothing stands out. You think, oh dearie me, what have they done here? It's yeah. um, I think I could actually see myself reading that and enjoying it. Yeah. Because I think I think those parallels between this fantasy world drawn into the everyday world is always an interesting yeah. thing and, and uh, in some ways it's quite an easy conduit for sort of comedy and amusement it is, yeah. but um it's a really nice one yeah and because orcs are always you know you never you never hear the orcs motivation yeah no they're just grunting beasts aren't grunting they things. Yeah. they are just yeah incredibly evil and it's really lovely to be able to get um you know into their psychology a little bit and hear about orcs' parents and things like that, you know, sort of domestic scenes. So, yeah, it's it's a very nice idea. Yeah, I just thought there were there's, uh, just funny little moments like, well, I can't find it now, but it's, it's something like it's a one-day walk to this particular place they want to get to, or two days by bus. It's <laughs> yeah. little things like that that he just chucks in, yeah. and I like that. I like those little things that you could just easily miss, but uh, it's good. That is, I mean, that is... Terry Pratchett, isn't it? That kind of uh, just lying down these things. Yeah. And do you know what I thought? Um, actually, do you know what I thought in this? Um, obviously, with the fantasy genre, there is kind of a, a license to use um, footnotes to your heart's content. <laughs> yeah, the footnotes. The and, footnotes are um, good. I think. I think I'm going to use that in my children's book. It kind of hadn't really occurred to me, but it's quite a nice way of um, explaining things without going into a load of exposition, adding extra bits, and kind of getting your, getting yeah, your yeah. jokes in without clunking up the the flow of things. Which, uh, might yeah, be nice. but you also you don't need them. You don't need to read them. No, but they're just like a little extra. Yeah, no, I think a little bonus. Nicely dealt with in this. Um, so there you go. We don't really have anything that's massively unconstructive, isn't it? Really? <laughs> um, it's sort of a not. You're right. There's not enough to go on yet, is there? Oh, he spelled sunset wrong. He spelled the word sunset wrong. <laughs> oh yeah, error. That's it. I noticed a few a few little oh, typo errors. God. Uh, so we'll be sending you them. Uh, Alex, yeah, mine uh, is really upset that. about that. Terrible, terrible <laughs> stuff. Oh, yeah, I gave my dad my first novel to read. And one of the first mm. things he, he said were, oh, there's quite a lot of errors, John. I'll, um, I'll mark them all up for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God damn it. Brilliant. Well done, mate. Yeah, thank you so much for sending that in. Yeah. You wrote a book. You wrote a bloody book. Another one. <laughs> oh, yeah, another bloody book. He's on, he's on, a, he's on some kind of uh, Kazim type. Blitz mm. knocking the words out, isn't he? He is. He's obviously taking the whole writing thing very seriously. Well, I don't think he could have done it without. I mean, I think when we started the podcast, he was one of the sort of the early adopters, and I you know, I think we've really inspired him, John. It's another one that I think <laughs> we have to take. We have to take without a lot us, of credit for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we don't like we don't like talking about it. Yeah, well done, us. Sorry, well it's, done, uh, us. It's only fair to say. Well, isn't it? you're welcome, guys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Don't mention it. Do not mention Here it. Here for you. Yeah. Here for you. Um, John, just before we finish uh, this week's episode yes we should probably uh just double check in with each other and ask the question oh god we forgot the question didn't would we? you like to ask the question? shall i ask who's going to ask the question go for it you ask it okay okay uh john uh-huh what have you been writing this week well i'm glad you asked me that um hmm. not a lot but <laughs> right, I, I did sit down with katie and we went back through what we've got for the happy marriage show right and have had a little play around with it. We're kind of looking, we're trying to s sort of step outside it and look at the structure a little bit and where it's going to go and the shape of it. And I found that right. quite useful. Okay. Uh, that's what we've been doing. Well, how, how far through do you think you are if you had to put a sort of percentage on well, it? Well, we've written, I mean, in terms of an actual script, we've written probably, I don't know, 35 minutes of stuff which isn't a right lot is it but it's right i don't know how much of that is going to but it's good it's bloody I mean, good it's incredible it's good stuff. stuff no i don't know how much of that is going to stay yeah but we sort of made a decision early on that we were going to almost like just write the presentation as two marriage social scientists or whatever we end up being yeah how they would actually do a ted lecture because we thought that yeah. that might be yeah. quite an interesting yeah. starting point and then how are we going to kind of mess with that and make it all go horribly wrong. Have you thought about getting Chat GPT involved? <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of a thing of the minute. Do you know? I don't think we will. No, I think we're going to leave that out. Uh, so, Tom. Yes, John. What have you been writing this week? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. I have been mainly 
outlining my kids' book, and I'm really pleased with it, actually. Well done, mate. got a massive piece of paper. Imagine a massive... What's the biggest piece of paper you can imagine? Oh, it's imagine huge, that. yeah, yeah. It's oh, and it's not that big. It's like A1. Oh, okay. So, but it's, so it's still a sizable piece of paper. But obviously, because this uh, children's book involves sort of a bit of time travel shenanigans, mm. I wasn't quite sure how to get it laid out so my head could understand what was going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. But I sort of did a, a timeline with, like, mm. arrows, basically, looping backwards and forwards and what have you and it just kind of it works as i just did the story and then it comes into the new timeline of the change timeline so there's a yeah i think i've got a good certainly a good starting story. so you visualized it in a way that you can actually understand it that's good yeah i think that's what I, what i need to do i was trying to write it i was yeah. trying to write it out in order if you like and it just wasn't quite I, just, I couldn't but seeing the actual little jumps in time just really helped get it in and i think it'll help hopefully avoid some yeah, yeah. plot holes and errors before That's, we even start that, i'm sure there will be plenty once we get that is done, tricky but... with time travel stuff isn't it especially if there's more than one time jump yeah which it sounds yeah, like yeah. there is oh there's lots there's loads oh, right. um, <laughs> oh, God. fortunately due to the rules of the universe um it's all going we can only time travel backwards so okay good um, that's that's something that makes it a little bit easier makes it slightly easier yeah but it is mm. uh there is a it's that thing obviously it's because it's as far as we know impossible um mm -hmm. there are always going to be paradoxes yeah and it's just how you deal with those within the rules of your universe isn't it it is yeah. doing like in the way that back to the future yeah. did so you've you've decided what those rules are now yeah pretty much yeah mm. and i think i think as well hopefully it'll be fun to andy stanton it a little bit and kind of play with that within the yeah, story yeah. as well almost refer to how the rules work or how confusing it is or how that wouldn't yeah. happen or <laughs> doing kind of a bit of uh that's that's kids kids love that kind of, of course stuff. they do uh, and we could maybe put that in a footnote so there you go I've learned a lot. that sounds great yeah ticking along ticking along i think i just i just need to break into that next bit of um mm. going right let's just get it all out but i think i've been putting that off for a few days for unknown reasons yeah. you know you just it's just like, oh yeah yeah if i actually start then i've started and i've kind of got to go with can it. i make an observation tom um yes i'll allow it <laughs> you sound more enthusiastic about this than i think anything before anything uh, writing wise right not like including when we went to that indian restaurant and stuff <laughs> no yeah. no okay, oh enough. god no you were no right yeah which is uh, that's got to be good yeah i think so yeah it's just uh i don't know i don't know why it is i don't know if it's just because this is what i should be doing or whether it just seems like a manageable thing rather than a mm. endless task or oh, i think it, i don't know just, i think uh, it's bang on i think you found your thing yeah well, we'll let's just say we'll that we'll see we'll see hey well done us both progressing something yeah, somewhere moving things along brilliant and I hope you are too, listeners. Yes. I hope you've been writing something. <laughs> <laughs> Tom is now waving his finger. I know, but we, this is what we established, John, that we are their muse. We have a responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Right. We can't just... Without us, anything. they'd be nothing. Yeah, nothing. Well, we should probably um, get out of their hair and let them do some writing. Yeah, get on, get on with yeah. some work. That's why I say, and we'll see you next right, time. Fantastic. Maybe just a little reminder that we are uh, just a, a kind of scrawny, puny little independent podcast. Yeah. We don't have the, the might of the great corporate machine standing behind us. So if you like that idea, if you like the idea of supporting independent uh, podcasts, tell a couple of friends about us or post a, post a review. That would be nice. A glowing review. Yeah. Just a glowing, like oh, that would be radioactively nice. glowing <laughs> review. Yeah. It doesn't need to be much. You could just say, you know. In fact, if you like, we could, we could write a review for We'd you. never get around to it, John. You've, you've, no, again, you've all promised there. If they could do it themselves, that would be better. That would be better. Yeah. Hey, hey, maybe at some point we could have like a we could have a page on the website with just some like suggested short reviews that people could copy and paste for convenience. Can we just get chat? That would be good, wouldn't it? BLT to do it. BLT. Yeah. However you want to do it, write as a review. Otherwise, you're not welcome to listen next time. And it's a really good episode. <laughs> so I would have found yeah. you. Earn your listening strikes. Absolutely. Bloody Luli. Right. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Cheerio. Take care. Keep writing. Hello. Hello. Where's everybody gone? Yeah. All right. Perfect. I mean, it's still recording, so there's all this shit at the end that you're gonna have to cut out. But listen, <laughs> so I know. I... Keep it all. Keep it all. You never. We never yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, keep everything. Out, so. <laughs> Hearing me chat shit about my editor. Um, Kish, if you hear this, it's lies. It's AI. <laughs> this isn't actually me. <laughs>